be with us today. It's an honor for us. And uh, we know that uh, we have uh, experienced electrophysiologists in the audience. We like and we believe that uh, atrial fibrillation ablation is uh, the right cure for most or many patients. And we know that the technology has evolved and uh, made our life easier. Uh, there are there are two major or three major companies who, who develop their own uh, algorithms and uh, make also our life easier and maybe uh, our results uh, better. So uh, Dr. Gallagher is going to give a talk about uh, the smart touch technology and the so-called ablation index, which is uh, a trademark from J&J uh, &J company, the CARTO system. And I'm sure he's going to enlighten us with uh, his uh, talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good evening, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. I'm here largely because I am an operator who, do, who does a lot of AF ablation. And I'm talking from the perspective of an electrophysiologist who believes that ablation is the right answer for most people. Now, this is a slide I've added because I've been sitting here this afternoon uh, listening to you. These are words from William Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. Now, Servilius Casca was the Roman senator who was first to stab Ju Julius Caesar. Shakespeare, as a royalist, patronized all his life by royalty and the nobility, of course despised the assassin of an emperor, and portrayed Casca in the worst possible manner. So he puts it in his mouth a very low form of English, using nay and I instead of no and yes, ne'er instead of never. And worst of all, he makes him completely unknowing of Greek, so that having sat there and listened to the greatest of all orators, Cicero, he failed to understand a word because he was not educated enough to understand Greek. Well, that was my afternoon today. <laughs> so I apologize, first of all, for having to deliver this in a lesser language. I have to disclose I have received funding from these companies. Today's trip was paid for by Biosense Webster, but the content is not in any way controlled. They haven't paid me anything near enough to tell me what to say. Back in the 20th century, electrophysiology conquered death. Not necessarily all death, but between defibrillators and ablation of accessory pathways, a large proportion of the death that, pres that presented to us. Conquering death is a hard act to follow, and it leaves you in a difficult situation of what to do next. But it is difficult to remember sometimes in a world like this, increasingly ruled by tyrants, plagued by epidemic disease, stalked by threat of nuclear destruction and so on. But the really big problem is atrial fibrillation. I remind myself of that every morning. The treatment for symptomatic atrial fibrillation began 234 years ago. Foxglove extract controlled the ventricular rate and therefore the symptoms. And for the next 213 years, nothing really advanced. Now they learned to grind the stuff down and extract the active ingredient into little blue pills. They introduced beta blockers to do the same thing, perhaps better for some people. But the next big advance was in 1998. You don't necessarily have to agree with all of this. You may discuss it and disagree afterward. But to me, the next big advance after foxgloves was lasso ablation catheters, sorry, lasso mapping catheters, and ablation catheters to isolate the pulmonary veins. And that was the first real cure of atrial fibrillation. Previous therapies may have addressed some of the underlying conditions, but no one cured atrial fibrillation until 1998. We've had a series of advances since then, most of them are small incremental changes, little improvements, ways of doing the same old thing better. 
But to me, the biggest of all of these was just three years ago with the introduction of algorithms to quantify and verify the lesions that we're producing. And that's what the equation I'm talking about looks like. That is the equation that leads us to the ablation index. The, the index is just the product of this. It is an equation that takes in the contact force, uh, the power being delivered, and the time for which it is delivered. It's an easy equation to memorize, hold in your head, and calculate out when you need it. Just as you all hold in your head the Nernst equation and apply it to the prevailing al electrolyte levels within and without each myocyte before you administer an antiarrhythmic drug, one assumes. That's sort of a joke, but of course we don't calculate things in our heads. In fact, most of us, I suspect, never calculate anything or remember a number at all anymore. Machines have become smaller, um, faster and more sophisticated, allowing the humans to become enormous and slow. So the machine tells us the number, and it does it in real time. We turn on our ablator. After eight seconds, a number starts to scroll up on the screen, and when it reach our, reaches our target, we can stop the delivery. So our machine tells us when our lesion has reached the level that we have decided from the start. And at George's, we've been using fairly standard settings. We took this methodology on a little over two years ago. We've done something approaching 1,000 cases with it now. And we're using fairly standard settings. We started by doing some cases blinded to the results. Um, we were told afterwards what sort of numbers we had been getting. And then we duplicated those going forward until we got enough experience to decide what were the right numbers. And the number I'm using at present is 350 on the back wall and 450 on the anterior wall. That is the product of the equation I've shown you and the number I aim, I aim for for each of the lesions. And, and so we form lesions rather more quickly and more objectively than we did before. In the old days, we used to do ablation with the catheter in constant movement. So whether or not you put a lesion on a given spot was up to the technician who was running the machines for you, and often dictated by the operator himself or herself, telling the technician, put a lesion there, put a lesion there. That's, that's clearly not objective. You can limit the subjectivity through discipline, but I, I can tell you most people were not disciplined. They put the lesions where they wanted to see them. Now the machine puts the lesion where the machine believes the lesion ought to be, and the, the machine is objective. And that's a really big advance. So the process is now much more objective and much more uniform. So the lesions go on one after another in line. Essentially, you put the catheter on a spot, you wait a couple of seconds till you're, till you're sure it's stable, you turn on the energy, your lesion is typically formed in something between eight and 20 seconds, and then you stop and you move on to the next spot. The move between lesions, typically four millimeters. And four millimeters at a time, 30 seconds or so for each lesion, you, you get to your 40 lesions to encircle a pair of veins very quickly. And having done it, it is done. You get around a pair of veins once, and in almost all cases, they are isolated. Previously, we would have to isolate, do a line around the veins, then go between the veins, then come back and pick up spots we'd missed. Now you go around once, they're isolated, and they stay isolated to the end of the procedure. So this brings to mind a process or a tendency that has occurred in manufacturing industry since the start of this century. In previous times, manufacturing industry was all about churning out large volumes of a product, paying a lot of people to churn those out, and then paying another bunch of people to check the product that you had made. That is wasteful. In most manufacturing industries, in the late 20th century, or in the first couple of years of this century, 
they reached a level of reproducibility that allowed them to eliminate the checking. In other words, if you get it right first time, you don't have to go back and check. And that allowed many companies to fire their entire quality control department, or at least whittle them way down to a small number of people. Of course, the initial process of rendering things reproducible largely derived from firing all the manufacturing workers and replacing them with robots. So altogether, it's a good news story. So that, that process is known as right first time, and it is now very widespread in manufacturing. For the first time, I think, with this technology, we are getting close to doing ablation in that manner. Now, this is important. We, the operators in electrophysiology, are inclined to use the technology that pleases us. I guess I started using CARTO mapping because the, the maps are nice. The maps reproduce accurately the anatomic reality that I know to be present. They're easy to work with. They tell me where the catheter is. I don't have to fluoro much. But that's all unimportant. The only person in the room who is really important is the patient. There are quite a number of other people in the room. It varies from country to country, but in the UK, I would always have a radiographer to run the x-ray machines, a physiologist to run the various electrophysiology machines, uh, at least one nurse, frequently an anesthetist and an anesthetic assistant. So there are a lot of people in the room whose time is valuable. Their opinions all matter as much as mine, or more than mine. But always we come back to the patient as the person whose opinion matters much. And I can tell you the patient does not care a bit whether I am amused by the procedure. Their priorities are fairly clear. First of all, they don't want to be killed or have a stroke as a result of the procedure. They therefore don't want it to drag on for an enormously length of, length of time because that makes it somewhat more dangerous. They want a result that lasts. No patient goes through a procedure for a success that lasts a year. They go through a procedure because they expect their AF to be cured for a long time. Maybe not for all their lives, but certainly for something of the order of five years or ten years or more. So they want a number of things that are actually very reasonable, and it is our duty to deliver all of that. The other people in the room also want a satisfied patient. They want the, the procedure to turn out right, and above all, not to kill anyone. They also want things to finish at a reasonable time, and I think more than most characteristics, they want the procedure to be predictable. If they start a procedure at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, they want it to be over at 5, so they can go home and have dinner with their children or something of that sort, whatever it is that they do. And then we have people who pay us to do the procedures. And of course, they want satisfied patients. Above all, patients who have one procedure and don't have to come back for more. They want satisfied staff, at least the hospital management do, because satisfied staff don't have to be paid as much. And they also want predictable procedures, because overtime costs a lot of money. So we look at procedure duration. Now, in the old days, and old days in electrophysiology is not that long ago, the procedures were long. These are, these are data of our own from a paper that derived from data of about 10 years ago. We move on a couple of years to a paper we wrote on the introduction of the STSF catheter. That applied to data from about five or seven years ago. The durations have dropped. And we're running another trial now, started last year. And when you look at the preliminary data from that, they compare in an interesting manner to the data from the previous two studies. So the procedure durations have all dropped, whether we're using cryotherapy or radiofrequency. The radiofrequency ones have dropped more, and that drop was related to, temporarily related to, and I think causally related to, the introduction of ablation index. But more important than the drop in the duration is the improved predictability. The problematic part of these is not just the, dur the duration, but the size of the error bars. The error bars on the durations have become much smaller, meaning that the procedures 
have become much more uniform in their duration. So the whole thing is, has become more of a production line. The patients come in, a transeptal is done quite quickly, and a lasso catheter, at least on a, a first ablation, it's usually a, a lasso catheter to map the left atrium. The lasso is used to form a three-dimensional map, after which we create the set of lesions, as previously mentioned. The lesions ideally all touch each other. In this example, we came back to fill in a couple of gaps identified at the end of the procedure in this process. But even with these gaps, these veins had all isolated. Now, I'm just going to exit this program for a moment because I couldn't open this within PowerPoint. So we have fewer examples now of redo procedures. Well, partly that's because we've only been using ablation index for two years, and in the system I work in, it takes six months from the time I put someone on the waiting list to the moment I get their ablation done. But we're also seeing fewer redos. So this is a patient in whom I did an ablation for persistent atrial fibrillation. Came back with an atrial tachycardia, and the veins are all very nicely isolated. You can see an isolated pair of veins on the right. So no electrograms between the veins there. A single circumferential set has isolated both. On the left, you get this bit of voltage on the anterior part of the, right of the left superior vein. But that's just deriving from the appendage here. When you look at the vein from behind, it is all isolated. In this patient, I also did a roof line, which has remained intact. I did a low posterior line here to isolate the posterior wall. That had come back, and the atrial tachy was coming in and out of this area. So that was easily terminated with a single point of ablation down here, re-isolating all of this. Now, this is the baseline map. If I had remapped at the end, which would have been a waste of time, this would all have been red, representing zero amplitude. In other words, no electrical activity at all. And there's a line at the mitral isthmus here, also perfectly good. So all the major circuits gone. So technically, we're doing far better work. We're getting really good results. We're still not, we still haven't finished this story, of course. In this patient, just out of interest, I mapped the right atrium as well. So here you see right and left atrium together. Here between the two, the groove of the aorta, where the aorta indents both. And over here, the superior vena cava. I'll just take off the left atrium to make the right clearer and bring it around AP. So you can see here, right atrial appendage. And we have a good four centimeters of quite large electrograms extending up the superior vena cava. Well, in this instance, I left it alone because it's not a comfortable area to ablate. But we'll see. If he comes back, I will know I was wrong could well happen. So we've got a lot of work to do on the persistent AFs, but the technical advances of the last couple of years have been really massive. And this sort of picture of you know, an AF ablation starting at veins punctured 6.30 in the evening, everything over and done by, where is it? Yeah, 8.15, sheets are out and everything's done. That's now common. We have not had a steam pop in the left atrium since we took this on again. That's close to 1,000 cases now. Steam pops are the cause of the worst of the tamponades. If you're doing this, um, keeping the patient immobile is crucial. Putting those lesions all in a line with a four millimeter distance between them requires you to keep the patient still. So we're doing most of these under general anesthesia. We're doing them with total paralysis rapid shallow ventilation, so typically a tidal volume, something around 350, 400 mils, with a ventilatory rate of 20 breaths per minute with the atrium paced at 100 beats per minute to keep a fixed relationship between respiratory and um, cardiac movement. You have to use a foot pedal if you're doing this because it's going to be something like 80 deliveries instead of the previous small number. Before I took this on, my typical AF ablation took 
four RF deliveries lasting a thousand seconds each. So, the ablation index has made our procedures faster, made them much more predictable. It seems to have made the isolation of the veins very much more reliable, and it appears to have improved safety. This leads us in important directions. The next step is going to be very short duration lesions with higher power. It would be speculation to, to, to talk about what might arise from that. We do seem to have cut down on steam pops and therefore the worst of the tamponades. We no longer um, worry about having to send a patient to cardiac theater to repair the damage produced by a steam pop. This means perhaps we can do ablations in non-surgical centers including with radiofrequency energy, which we have not been doing. We've been doing cryo balloons in non-surgical centers, but not RF ablations for AF. It also gives us the ability to tailor the lesions to the patient's characteristics. We can say a given patient is very thin. Maybe we can just get away with a, an ablation index of 300 or 350 instead of 450 or 500. So with this, I think we are starting to deliver pulmonary vein isolation that is quick, safe, and permanent. So getting a right first time approach to each lesion gives us potentially a right first time for each vein and therefore for each patient. That's important because there are barriers to the widespread application of AF ablation. One of them is the reputational one. In the early days, the procedures were not very effective and consequently, there are physicians out there who don't completely believe in the technology. And therefore, because of that, some funding authorities that are not keen to fund it. But we must press on with this because the alternative is far worse. Most of you look far too young to remember the CAST study, but it is the foundation study of modern electrophysiology. And for those of you who don't remember it, it, it is crucial. You have to get this one out and read it. This came out, well, the first results were released the year I graduated from medical school, and I was already interested in arrhythmias. They took the group they thought would best demonstrate the life-saving potential of antiarrhythmic drug therapy. And the antiarrhythmic drugs killed 30 patients in the active treatment group a very clear doubling of sudden death mortality produced by antiarrhythmic drugs. Now, people talk this study out of relevance, but it is not irrelevant. People try to say, well, that population was different to the populations we deal with now. They're not saying that on the basis of any evidence. They're just saying it because it suits them. Cabana's study got some publicity recently because it showed no improvement in survival in the population randomized to ablation. That's a very good result. The previous studies show the rhythm control, largely by pharmacological means, increased mortality. So a no significant change stroke tendency to lower mortality in the ablation group in Cabana, that's a really good result. The mortality that does exist as a result of ablation, we need to work on. About half the mortality that exists is from esophageal injury. We're now working on a trial to try and eliminate that by controlling the temperature in the esophagus during the ablation. And so I think we've moved a couple of steps closer to the goal, which is the elimination of atrial fibrillation-related symptoms without the need for the dangerous antiarrhythmic drugs that are the only alternative. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Gallagher. Very informative uh, uh, lecture and uh, technology is here to support us and the patients. Are there any cases that uh, you cannot actually implement the ablation index? For example, if you cannot get a good touch in some areas of uh, the left atrium, uh, in the carina sometimes, uh, uh, tell us about the difficulties. So the, the carina is interesting because I I'm just trying to remember an instance where I had to ablate the carina. Using the ablation index, we're doing a single circle around both veins each side, and therefore just not touching the carina. We're getting rid of it by going outside it. The mitral isthmus is still a difficult area. So there is a literature on roof lines 
with ablation index showing that it, it um, gives a better result than pre-ablation index ablation. On the mitral isthmus, it seems to have had less benefit. And that's an interesting area. I think that is a line that we're still not very good at. Very difficult area. It's a very difficult area. Interestingly, the caper tricuspid isthmus is the other area where we don't really need ablation index because we can fix it every time. But um, I, I still know nothing that works as well on the caper tricuspid isthmus as a 10 millimeter blazer at 80 watts. Thank you. Power versus um, power is far better than sophistication at the caper tricuspid isthmus. Professor Manolis and then Dr. Lisitas. by point ablation anyway. So it uh, takes time, although time, uh, the duration of the procedure got um, better over time. Can this technology be applied to a circular catheter or single shot techniques like, and how often do you use, uh, for example, cryoablation? And would the circular catheter, the PVAC uh, that has been improved, could this technology be applied there and get things uh, uh, done faster? You, you couldn't apply this to a circular mapping a circular catheter, it, it requires, you know, the, the contact force is one of the components of the equation. And unless you could work out a way of measuring contact force for each electrode around your circle, you couldn't use this. Uh, the people have moved on. I mean, Ablation Frontiers, I think, is still out there, but I don't know anyone who uses it anymore, the PVAC. PVAC. The Helios is the radio frequency single shot technology that is now entering use. I, I have not used it. In answer to the question about the proportion in which we use cryo balloon at the moment, for me, that's close to 50% because I'm running a trial, which is essentially not much more than a rerun of fire and ice, but we're randomly, randomly assigning people to one or other. So yes, we, we do use a considerable amount of cryo balloon, but for a reason. And I guess you are faster doing the ablation with the cryo, or not? It, it is still faster, but nowhere near as much as it was. The chief advantage for us with cryo is that we don't use general anesthesia for it. Not, not that it is less painful, it is still painful, but the fact that the patients move during a cryo balloon ablation doesn't matter. They can move all they like, the thing is going to stay in place. Uh, uh, with radio frequency, if they move, that is inconvenient. Are you using uh, second generation or third generation with short tip you can monitor it's the a, ablation? It's, it's a second generation. Though okay. we, we used the short tip for a period, the, the previous version of the short tip, and honestly, I don't believe it was any different. I, don't, I think the balloon nose length is a very minor characteristic. Yeah. Dr. Lisitas? Um, congratulations for you, uh, Peter. Um, just a quick question, because um, actually with my friend Andy Sayer, we, we remember all the audits we were doing for Brompton and Harefield Hospital uh, after ablation procedures, and there's a painful question that's running uh, the last 10 years. Uh, we were doing the ablation, we were seeing the patients in the outpatient clinic. Uh, they were happy patients with no AF. And then in a seven-day halter after six months, we were finding an episode of AF for 45 seconds or two minutes. And this means that he is an unsuccessful uh, AF ablation. What's your uh, perception of all this definition? And um, I'm thinking that we're shooting our foot as electrophysiologists, but yeah. will it change? Do you still use it? We, 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 ha we can only use the definitions that are available to us. If I'm running a trial, I'll use the definitions that are out there. There are a lot of things wrong with the definitions. Uh, there are a lot of things wrong with the structure of all our trials. I, I would pick number one, the use of a one-year time window for the follow-up. You cannot judge success at one year. We should, be, you know, again, I said it before, no one goes through a procedure for one year of sinus rhythm. People come to us because they want to get back to sinus rhythm for life. So our persistent AFs, we should be looking at five-year maintenance of sinus rhythm, not one year. We should not be designating something a failure because a patient had 35 seconds of atrial fibrillation on a monitor. And of course, the more we look for failure, the more failure we find. So the more we monitor the patients, the more we've got to move toward definitions based on AF burden. 
And I think the recent trials presented at uh, EHRA, which were loop recorder based and showed apparent low rates of success, I think those are an illustration of that. People looked so hard for failure that they found it. Yes, sure. Dr. Anastasagis. Excellent talk. I would like to ask you, what about the profiles of, of your patients? I mean, do you expect the same results from a patient with uh, coronary heart disease, with a patient with hypertrophic adenopathy, or with a patient who had a genetic form of AF? So the HCMs are difficult. The ischemics not so much more than the others. The, the chief characteristics are the patient's age and the AF burden. So a, a persistent, someone who's been in AF for well, more than three years solidly, is, is always going to be extremely difficult. Pa patients with a large left atrium, largely as a product of that. And the HCMs are a, they're a particular group that I think is not well represented in the literature. The literature gives success rates, rates for HCM not as much different as I have seen. I've seen a lot of difficulty in HCM. I think the problem with HCM comes from hypertension because people with hypertensive LVH are not, not nearly as difficult as the people with true genetic HCM. But they're all difficult populations. On the other hand, you can achieve some success in all of those. So we, we are inclined to take all comers if they accept the risks, accept the limitations of the procedure, and want to, want to try everything possible to get back to sinus rhythm. That's very wise, and Thank you. I think it's a fair deal. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Οπότε συνεχίζουμε και το δεύτερο, το 